sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Welcome everybody. I'm here with Bill Gates. I'm David Rubenstein and today we're going to talk about Bill's new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, a book I've read and thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot, but also a little depressed about the problems, how great they are. So Bill, um, the theme of the uh, National Book Festival this year is open a book, open the world. Uh, how important are books to you? Were you a, a good reader when you were little or do you not read that much in terms of books? I was super lucky that uh a grandmother in particular read a lot of books uh, to me and my sisters, and that developed a love of books. You know, she'd pick, you know, Dr. Doolittle, lots of fun stuff, and then when I was able to read, I was very avid. Uh, you know, over the summers, there was always a public uh, library would have a contest about who could read a lot of books, and uh, an addiction to reading has been a, a key secret of my success. And you have uh, a book collection, I think, in scientific area. Why have you been focusing on scientific books? And is your most famous one the Leonardo uh, Codex? Yeah, that's probably the most valuable book I have. I have an Adam Smith uh, Wealth of Nations book. Uh, you know, some authors that I like, like J.D. Salinger, I have the you know, draft edition of Catcher in the Rye. I'm very lucky to have a library with some amazing things in it. And, you know, I make sure those circulate out so people can see them. Uh, it's, it's a joy to have all those great books. So let's talk about this book. Um, you have been famous through your foundation and focusing on, let's say, two issues initially, uh, education and health in the most challenged areas in the world. Uh, is this a new area that you're gonna take on through the foundation or are you doing this outside the foundation, the whole climate issue. Yeah, my exposure to climate as a significant problem actually came because of the foundation's work in Africa. And we were working with a lot of farmers there uh, because, of course, the more productive they are at growing food, the more we can avoid malnutrition. And uh, that is a big predictor of health. And so what they were saying is that their crops were getting worse. And so I, I entered into uh, a 15-year journey of learning about climate. The part of the climate work we need to do to help uh, those developing countries, uh, mostly Africa, that's done through the foundation. So better, better seeds, uh, better ways of collecting water. Uh, but the change to the energy system and the industrial uh, things I'm doing outside the foundation by uh, funding new companies and a broad set of things I call breakthrough energy. Uh, because that's the for-profit sector that creates all the things that cause the emissions. So reducing emissions, uh, they call mitigation, while helping to minimize the damage of emissions, they call adaptation. And so that's the part where the foundation leads, whereas mitigation, I've got this breakthrough energy group. So uh, let's talk about uh, what we can do in uh, our lifetime. I'm older than you, so I'm not going to be around probably as long as you, but um, I've always thought that it was unrealistic that we could change our habits in terms of energy usage uh, and carbon emissions in a short enough period of time so that I would actually get the benefit of it. In other words, and if I change my habits or you change your habits or anybody change their habits, it's our great great grandchildren that might benefit. We're not really going to benefit. Is that true or wrong or not? Well, the, um, the end consumption that people still want to eat meat and they still want to travel and they still want buildings with cement and steel. You know, my belief in the book is that overall we're not going to be change people's behavior so we eliminate much of the demand for those things. Particularly when you look at developing countries where they're still building basic shelter, lights at night, you know, a nutritious diet to get rid of malnutrition. So the assumption in the book is that only through innovating and in how we make all those things, including electricity, uh, food, uh, and only by changing that so that they have no emissions will we be able to get realistically to zero. So in large part, 
It's that process of how electricity gets made or how your car gets uh, powered that we have to drive to zero emission uh, rather than completely uh, getting rid of the demand for all those things. So if we can electrify fast enough uh, and make these changes, we will get emissions down uh, towards the end of the time when we're likely to be alive. Uh, but your point that getting the world to start cooling off, uh, even in the best case, it's actually way out there in 2060s, 2070s, that you start to see that temperature begin to drop back to where it belongs. So under the Paris Accord, which the United States was in as an original signatory, then we were out, and now we're back in, um, we are not going to zero emissions. We're going to reduce the emissions by the year 2030. Is that right? That's right. The 2030 is an intermediate goal where the Biden administration has upped the ambition there quite dramatically to get 50% uh, versus the baseline. But the goal is by 2050, which is very hard. The 2030 goal is hard, but even harder is that 2050 goal of actually getting the U.S. to, to zero. But your proposal was to get the whole world to zero. And um, by what time do you think that's realistic if we adopted your proposals and things that you want us to do? How, how soon could we really get there? Uh, to get to 2050 would require us to drive a lot of innovation uh, so that the extra cost of uh, being green is, say, 95% lower than it is today. And so a key point I make in the book is not only that there's many sources of emissions, but that the responsibility of the rich countries, particularly the United States, is not only to reduce its own emissions, but to do it through innovation so that the cost to other countries, as these innovations are made available, available globally, that the cost to them, so a country like India, who did very little to cause this problem because their emissions historically have been super low, that we owe it to those countries to have dramatic innovation. And so that our own cost of getting to zero is reduced, but also the other countries. And so, you know, the whole world's in this together. The only reason we want the whole world to get to zero is that that's what it takes to stop the temperature from constantly going up. It's, you know, we're filling a bathtub every year we emit CO2 uh, and we get to temperature increases that uh, destroy the ability to live near, near the equator and create uh, tornadoes and sea level rise and a variety of things that even up in the US uh, will be horrific over a long period of time. So let's suppose the United States does everything perfectly and they do everything you recommend, but other countries do nothing. Am I going to be better off or worse off if I'm living in the United States? Because eventually the air and the climate and the other things that are coming from the other parts of the world. So does it do any good for one country or one part of the world to do it? Or does everybody have to do it if it's really going to be an impact? You have to have uh, not only the rich countries, but also the middle income countries uh, participate. There may be, you know, the, the poorest 15 percent uh, whose emissions are quite small. Uh, and may need to be entirely subsidized to make the shift. But yes, China, India, we've all got to participate. And that's why this, uh, the, the total cost, what you give up to be green, what I call the green premium, is a measure of how hard what we're asking them to do is. The ideal is you'd get to a situation like electric cars. With electric cars, uh, the actual cost of an electric car versus a gasoline car, we can see over the next 10 to 15 years, that actually gets to zero. And so when the entire world has that technology for cheap electric cars, fast charging, long uh, mileage capability, then it's not a burden uh, to tell them to shift. So if you get that green premium all the way to zero, which we will in many categories, including electric cars, then we can count on the collective action uh, of, of making that change. Uh, if you have a place like cement, um, where the green premium is very high, uh, where today it's almost double the price, 
to be green, uh, unless we innovate, we're not going to find it very easy. And so your point about those emissions will still be coming from the other countries, uh, and since you, the U.S. is only 15% of emissions, uh, and these growing middle-income countries are the majority uh, going forward, yes, we have to make it cheap enough for them and find ways of encouraging them uh, to solve a global problem. Let's talk about electric cars. Some people have said electric cars are better than um, internal combustion engine cars, but on the other hand, some people say you have to produce electricity for these cars to be charged. Where does the electricity come from? Isn't that coming from burning carbon emission kinds of things? And also, you have precious metals uh, that have to be mined that are in the, the battery. So are, are electric cars as good as people think, or are they better than what we have? Well, that question's a very good question, because you only get the benefit of an electric car if you both switch the passenger cars to be electric, and if you take the electricity generation system and switch it over to zero emission, like solar, wind, nuclear, uh, a variety of things. So it's a two-step process before you get the benefit. Uh, in terms of the precious metals, there are plenty of ways uh, to innovate, you know, we, uh, either to up the supply, say, of lithium at cheap price or to avoid the use of cobalt. So yeah, I, I don't worry about uh, that, you know, breakthrough energy, among others, is investing in finding more of those minerals and, and actually designs that minimize the demand for them. So that sh won't be that much of a limit to the rapid adoption of electric cars. Now, some people say, uh, we can't really think this is a man-made problem. Trees emit um, carbon dioxide. Uh, cows enorm emit enormous amounts of methane gas, uh, among other things. So um, if we didn't have um, carbon at all on the face of the earth, we, in the sense of no coal, no gas, no oil, and we never used it, would we not still have some uh, heating up problem in the earth or would it be de minimis? Yeah, in fact, if you took the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere all the way down to zero, this planet would be too cold to live on. And so when we talk about carbon in the atmosphere, uh, zero is not the right number, but neither is 419 parts per million headed to much higher numbers because then it gets too hot. And what's happened is we've taken all the carbon that was buried uh, from trees that grew you know, m many millions of years ago, and now we're putting that CO2 up into the atmosphere. So the rate of CO2 increase is very dramatic, particularly over the last 50 years, uh, as we're using so much of coal, natural gas, which collectively are called hydrocarbons. And that's, you know, 95% is coming from the those hydrocarbons. Uh, the other sources of emission uh, don't add up to much, and, you know, they're not the problem. That's not where we're changing and creating this forcing up to the very high temperatures that causes all these extinctions and sea level rise and tornadoes and those things. So uh, you, we want carbon to stay uh, down, you know, well below 500 parts per million uh, so that in, even in the equatorial regions, you can actually go outside. Now, before coal was really discovered and then oil and gas, uh, people used to warm themselves with, I, I guess, um, wood, to burn wood or things like that. So for thousands of years of organized history, people were emitting carbon in some ways when they're burning wood or some things like that. But it was only really in the last couple hundred years when we really began to use coal, um, I, gas, and oil that the problem became much bigger. Is that right? Exactly. The, the tree, if you burn a tree, then if you're not deforesting the world, then carbon, that carbon will be uh, recollected as the tree regrows. So it's taking carbon that's buried way underground and bringing that up all of a sudden that creates this disequilibrium. Uh, and that, as you say, that comes from coal, natural gas, and oil. So let's suppose um, we didn't discover coal, oil, or natural gas. 
Would civilization that we now know, and we have many great things in civilization, would it be several hundred years behind where we are now, or would we be more advanced because we were more creative in using solar or wind? Uh, we would be hundreds of years behind because we've used the unbelievable energy density uh, of these hydrocarbons to create our modern civilization. You know, gasoline costs less than bottled water. It's very, very cheap. You know, coal you can buy for like $4 a ton. And it's just unfortunate that there's this side effect uh, that's built up over time that is so threatening as you get uh, to, to large numbers of, of emissions. But we'll look back and say, okay, we bootstrapped civilization using hydrocarbons. Uh, and that really is why there was an industrial age, and it's why you know, we have lights and electricity and transport, and we can make materials like steel and cement. Energy intensity is the hallmark of why after 1800, progress went into a very, very different uh, rate than all those thousands of years that came before. So uh, let me ask you about uh, the situation that exists in, let's say, emerging markets or developing countries. They would say, well, Bill, um, okay, I want to support your idea, and, and there should be a uh, reduction in emissions, but why should I do it? You in the United States, you've been polluting the atmosphere for a long time. You in Europe, you've been doing it. Why can't I pollute a little bit and get my civilization further? So you guys make the cuts, and let me keep producing what I want to produce. Why is that an unfair argument? No, it's actually a, quite a legitimate argument uh, that the historical emissions, the U.S. is by far uh, the biggest. In terms of current emissions now, uh, China, which is a fairly wealthy middle-income country, is the largest source of emissions. And, you know, India will become, as they electrify and, and provide basics uh, to all of their uh, 1.3 billion uh, people, they'll be a huge emitter. And so unless we make it very cheap to go green, and to some degree, uh, for the very poor countries, provide some subsidies, uh, they will tell us no. They, they will say, hey, we're not going to slow down building basic shelter. And so the current cost to subsidize them would be over $5 trillion a year. That's just not going to happen. And that's where innovation comes in to say, okay, can you reduce that number by ideally 90% uh, or 95%? You know, then you get down uh, to a level, say at 95 percent, 250 billion a year, where it is possible to help out the poor countries. The rich countries could realistically bear uh, some of those additional costs, and that deals with this justice issue that we shouldn't be holding them back in terms of air conditioning when the uh, you can barely live uh, near the equator with the the heating. Uh, caused by climate change. So why do you think that there are some people that resist doing the kinds of things that you suggest we should do? Is it because they don't believe man-made uh, emissions are the problem? Or is it because they don't want the cost involved? Or they just don't like the people who are advocating uh, for these kind of uh, things? What do you think is the reason that you still have a fairly big resistance to the idea that climate change is even a, a real man-made problem? Yeah, the number of people who deny that the phenomenon exists is going down. Uh, the number of people who say, gosh, the other countries won't go along, so it's hopeless, uh, you know, they're asking a legitimate question, and that's why these conferences, uh, including one coming up in uh, late 2021 in Glasgow, will be uh, important to show that people are working together. We also now have people who think it's easy to solve that that is, they haven't looked at all the sources of emissions and the scale of change required. Uh, and so they're not helping get uh, the research money and the innovation agenda going at full speed. So this is a complex issue. Uh, you know, the amount of science you need to know to yourself have thought through all the different things, why the temperature, you know, uh, changed you know, there was a period where it wasn't going up that much, then a period was going up faster. This is, is tough. And so uh, the, a key reason I wrote the book 
was to say to the people who think it's easy, no, it's hard, and the people who think uh, that it's impossible, to remind them that innovation in all these areas is happening. The only question is, is it happening fast enough? And how, what kind of incentives and policies or behaviors should individuals, companies, and governments engage in to give us uh, the best chance of avoiding this climate disaster? Well, speaking of innovations, it was reported this week that you and Warren Buffett are putting together a nuclear plant. I think it was in Wyoming or someplace. I forget exactly where. But um, is that realistic? Because uh, building nuclear power plants usually takes five, six, seven years. And a lot of people are worried about the emissions from them if something goes bad, like in Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island. What is it that you're doing with your company that you've invested in? I think it's called Terra. What is that company doing that is different than the traditional nuclear power plants? And why is that going to be better than what we already have? Well, the advantage of nuclear is that it generates energy uh, no matter what the weather is. And so as we move to use solar <clears throat> and wind for over 80% of the generation, the idea of having some generation that even in tough weather conditions still is available is quite valuable. So unless you get a miracle in terms of storing energy, this constant energy capability would help you maintain reliability, which is very, very important. You don't want people to freeze or boil uh, because the electricity goes away. And uh, you know we've seen periods of unreliability, even though we're not using uh, that high a percentage of renewables yet. It's un still under 10%. So the, the idea that we should at least try to come up with a nuclear reactor that is cheap enough and safe enough that it can be part of the solution. That's something I funded. Uh, as you mentioned, there's now a site in Wyoming uh, where this pilot plant, which is a very new design in terms of the safety and cost, we can prove out does it work as well as it does uh, in the digital simulation. And if that goes well, uh, within five years, uh, then that would become uh, a, a choice uh, for for power generation. Uh, and so I'm excited that, you know, we're, we're doing the work. Uh, and, you know, if, you, if it's ready in five years, then by 2050, uh, you can have a lot of those reactors helping out because it's completely green energy and we really have solved the safety uh, problem. Now, in your book and in our discussion so far, you've mentioned Breakthrough Energy, which is a fund that you created, you know, having the second one and it's investing in uh, new tech technologies in the energy area, but it might take a long time for them to come to fruition. Have you found any yet that you think are gonna really make a big dent, right, in the near future in uh, emissions? Yeah, back in 2015, the last big uh, climate conference in Paris, I had been talking with governments about increasing their R&D, doubling their R&D over five years, and they agreed to do that if I agreed that we'd have uh, risk, high-risk funding, venture-type funding that was purpose-built for solving climate problems. And so my, all my efforts in climate through breakthrough energy, part of that is this ventures group. And that's gone very well. There's over uh, 50 companies now that Ventures has invested in. Uh, so far, it's actually going very well. I'm sure a lot of them will fail, but we've got incredible batteries. We've got wild ways of storing energy with a big heat pool or by just pressurizing water underground. Uh, it's early days still. Uh, these companies take longer than software companies, like a decade, because they actually have to build and prove their stuff works in an economic fashion. Uh, but if you, if you do all the things possible to accelerate innovation, more basic R&D money, uh, more uh, venture money, and then these projects where you take these technologies and try to build them and see how you can get the cost down. Uh, funding of that I call Catalyst, Breakthrough Energy Catalyst. That takes the pipeline and tries to drive it at full speed so that the, the, the green premiums go down as fast as possible. And that's what can, if things go well, enable us to hit this very ambitious goal of zero by 2050. So let's talk about uh, renewables and uh, that possibility. There's solar, there's uh, hydro, 
Um, there is uh, uh, other kinds of wind energy. So if I was going to be an investor and I wanted to guess where the world was going in terms of solar, wind, uh, hydro, other renewables, where would I put my money? Where do you think we're really going to go in terms of renewables, in terms of the best opportunity to invest, because it's going to have the biggest impact? Yeah, I've done an uh, open source project that simulates the grid of the future. And so you can plug in all the sources of power and the demand for power and how that uh, storage and nuclear and how that's all fitting together to see the reliability and, and the cost. And as you say, a huge part of that will be solar, uh, which in the US, particularly the Southwest, works very well, wind, uh, both in the middle of the country and then offshore wind that still has a little bit of a premium, both on the West and East Coast. And then uh, for those tough periods, either heat waves or cold snaps, uh, a combination of storage, possibly with nuclear playing uh, a big role there. And we can see, okay, does it all work? And you have to do that for Europe and Asia uh, to make sure we have this zero carbon source of energy uh, that we'll need a lot more of because we won't be using gasoline or coal or natural gas, say, to heat houses with natural gas. We'll be using electricity instead. Uh, so it, it's a big challenge, but the utilities that step up uh, are going to be selling over twice as much electricity, and the renew renewable re build rates will be absolutely gigantic. That, you know, we have to actually go at four times the current rate. So although we're always impressed that, hey, that rate is built up, we're not near where we need to get to to finish this project in 30 years. So, Bill, you have become an expert in explaining complicated scientific things to people that might not be as scientifically oriented as you are, particularly government leaders. So when you go in and try to explain um, the pandemic and related uh, uh, issues like that to government leaders, and you try to explain uh, this issue, climate change, where do the eyes glaze over the most? Do they understand the science less in the case of the pandemic, or do they understand the science less in the case of uh, uh, energy? I'd say climate is harder because areas like how we make cement or how we make steel, um, you know, we just take it for granted. We, it's gotten so good and so cheap, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. With the pandemic, you know, sadly, you have, you know, a death rate every day, uh, whereas with climate, there are deaths. In fact, way more deaths than in this pandemic, but they're out there you know, 30 or 40 years hence, and yet you have to take action now to avoid that. There's no single innovation like the incredible COVID vaccines uh, that will bring, you know, climate to an end. And so I think it has reminded people that we need government to step up and, you know, protect citizens from really bad things. In the case of climate, although there's some uncertainty, these bad things are pretty well known. It's not as uncertain as the chance of a pandemic coming uh, which sadly we were not prepared for that, and it's cost us trillions of dollars and uh, so many deaths and educational deficits. You know, it's been a case where government, most governments, including the U.S., uh, was absolutely not ready. And so, you know, hopefully people say, well, I want government to do better on climate, but it requires more political backing. Uh, you know, all the young people, even, you know, both parties, will need to make sure this remains a priority over the next 30 years or we won't, we won't get there. Now, uh, President uh, uh, Obama put us into the Paris Accord, and then uh, President Trump technically, he pulled us out, but I don't know if we actually technically got out, because I think it takes three years to get out or something like that. I don't know if we ever actually ever got out, but um, to, when you talk to leaders around the world now under President Biden's leadership, uh, um, you're not, you know, you're not part of his administration, but do they say, we don't trust that you're going to not get out of it in the future, so we're not sure the United States is that reliable, or they say, thank God you're back in. Uh, what, how, what's their reaction to how we've handled this? Well, they're very thankful that the U.S. is a participant now in solving one of the biggest problems that uh, will cause, you know, unbelievable suffering and, you know, just totally mass migration greater than everything anything ever seen in history. 
they of course worry that you know if there isn't kind of a bipartisan consensus, will the U.S. have kind of a stop and go relationship to this problem? Which you know if we had 200 years, you could probably withstand that. But since we only have 30 years, uh, that's got to be a, a concern for them. But you know in the meantime. Uh, the fact that the R&D investment's going up, the incentives are going up, uh, some ambitious goals for 2030 and 2035 have been stated. Uh, the rest of the world is very enthused because there's no way we avoid a climate disaster without the U.S. taking a leadership role, particularly in its power of innovation. So let's suppose I read your book and I say, OK, I'm now convinced I should do something about it. What is the average person supposed to do? The average person probably isn't Bill Gates, doesn't have your access and influence. The average person reads it. What do you want the average person to do? Yeah, I'd start out with saying that everyone has a political voice. And particularly for young people, uh, maintaining this is a priority uh, over these decades to come. Uh, that is critically important. Uh, many people are employees, and so making sure your company is playing a leadership role. Uh, people are consumers, and so when you buy a car, uh, if you can afford an electric car, when you want, if you want to eat ground beef, uh, using as much of things like Beyond Meat or Impossible or others that are coming along, uh, so that you have no greenhouse footprint there. For many of the products you buy, you'll have a choice of buying something that uh, is non-polluting versus something that is. And that really, that consumer demand showing even a willingness to pay a little bit extra uh, can make a, a, a absolutely uh, critical difference. Suppose I say, look, I admit uh, emissions in the atmosphere. I can't do anything about it. My business does that. I'll, I'll plant some trees somewhere. Is that a good thing to do? Because some people think if you plant enough trees, you can absolve yourself from any problem. Is that really true or not? Well, the basic idea of being willing to pay for offsets uh, is fantastic, and that's just developing, and it's going to be super important. Sadly, it looks like in most cases uh, the trees either would have grown or they'll uh, get diseased or burned down. Uh, and so the amount that just brute force tree planting can help here is pretty small. And so the sophistication of what we certify as real offsets uh, that has gone from being very limited to allowing a lot of things that have zero impact. Now we're making that more sophisticated. And so we'll be able to say, OK, if you're funding a, a new green hydrogen project, you know, that does have a big impact. But putting trees in most locations sadly won't uh, uh, create a benefit because you'd have to make sure those trees never would have been there in the first place. And that you're funding 10,000 years of uh, replanting uh, every time there's a problem. So from being a, a young man, you were able to code and write code. I don't know how to do that, but I assume it's uh, complicated and not think I'm going to learn. But how hard is it to write code compared to writing a book? I mean, which is more frustrating, writing code or writing a book? And how long did it take you to, to work on this book? There's a lot of research in this book. And um, you know, I'm just curious how long it took you to do this. Well, I decided to be very involved in climate uh, back in uh, 2005. And so I've done learning sessions about five or six a year and done a lot of site visits. So I, I had about 15 years of work. I gave a TED Talk, actually. Uh, my 2000 TED Talk was a warning about climate change and uh, very consistent with what uh, is in the book. My 2015 pandemic TED Talk is way more famous uh, because, of course, that prediction sadly uh, came true. And so because I was drawing on the fact experts have been so wonderful at spending time with me, uh, it only took about six months. Uh, and then uh, I had a co-writer, Josh Daniel, who does a fantastic job. Uh, we had to change it somewhat because originally we were going to come out uh, uh, before the 2020 election, and we changed our mind. And so we did about a 15% revision uh, uh, and then put it out uh, uh, by the end of the year. And then we could talk about the fact Biden was elected and talk about this big upcoming meeting. But it wasn't, it wasn't that hard, but only because I'd 
I'd put so much effort into immersing myself in, in climate issues. Final question, Bill, um, and that's uh, this. Uh, when um, you made your prediction about the uh, pandemic, people didn't take you as seriously as probably they should. And when you made your prediction about uh, um, you know, other problems that you mentioned earlier, um, people didn't take you as seriously, perhaps. Um, what are you going to make your next TED talk about so we should know what the next problem is? Is it what's coming next or are you going to talk about that we have to worry about? Well, I think if we do the right things uh, on climate and we do the right things to avoid the next pandemic, uh, you know, that's, those are two areas I understand. And, you know, I think now uh, there's more support for putting the resources in there. Avoiding the next pandemic includes not just a naturally caused pandemic, but also bioterrorism, where somebody would intentionally use the advanced tools of biology to create a pathogen. That's a very scary one, and I, uh, you know, sadly, we do need to even prepare for that. Uh, if I can help the world be ready for climate and uh, various kinds of pandemics, I I'll, will have felt like uh, they've listened to me more than they've uh, you know, probably uh, it do in general. So that, you know, that's my big focus is speaking out on those two areas where I really am optimistic that if we do the right things, we can avoid the problem. I hope you'll focus as well on aging baby boomers like me, what we can do to keep our brain and body alive. If you could focus on that, I would be very appreciative. Well, I have to say, even though I'm not, uh, there's a lot of the... Uh, wealthy tech guys who fund that longevity work. I am doing some on Alzheimer's, uh, but uh, yeah, I agree. We, uh, uh, innovation can help in, in almost every way. Bill, thank you very much. I enjoyed reading How to Avoid Climate, uh, climate Disaster. Thanks very much for being with us today. Great to talk to you. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. And now we'd like you to hear more from the library's own experts on this topic. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is John Hessler, and I am the curator of the J.I. Kislak Collection of the Archaeology and History of the Early Americas. I am joining you today from one of the beautiful rooms in the Thomas Jefferson Building. The Kislak Collection contains hundreds of archaeological objects, rare books, and manuscripts relating to the history of the Americas from pre-Columbian times until the middle of the 19th century and is housed in the Rare Book and Special Collections in the Geography and Map Division here at the library. As Bill Gates and David Rubenstein discussed in their interview, climate is a complex thing. Both from a political and scientific perspective, there are few issues that have been discussed as much in the last few decades. From a scientific point of view, predicting it today requires the solution of complex mathematical equations and employs some of the fastest computers on the planet. Visualizing and trying to understand climate has, however, always been an issue. Few things have been more important to human beings as the weather, as it affects almost everything we do, from growing our food to what clothes we wear. Historically, there have been many attempts to understand the weather and to visualize the climate, and it was a subject that fascinated and obsessed some of the founding fathers of the United States. All of you, of course, know the name Ben Franklin and his interest in the sciences. Here we see a map from 1769, created by Franklin, which is the first to show the Gulf Stream. Franklin thought of it as a river in the ocean and theorized that the Gulf Stream influences the climate of the east coast of North America, from Florida to Newfoundland, and the west coast of Europe, as it brings warm water into the northern Atlantic from the south. Our second piece, is a copy of the Virginia Almanac from 1762, which, as most almanacs do, tries to give some insight into the weather. This particular copy from the Kislak collection is, however, unique in that George Washington annotated it and used it as a farming and weather diary. In it, he made notes of temperature, of rain, and of snow, and wondered why the reality of the weather was so different from the almanac's predictions. These are just two of the historically significant artifacts at the Library of Congress that show the long history of our trying to record and to understand the vast complexity of the Earth's climate, both of which, along with many others, are available on the library's website.